And we've gone as far as unplugging refrigerators, unplugging ice machines, turning off air conditioners, all these little things that maybe you live or work in this space that you just are numb to because you always hear it. But as soon as you fire that camera up, it's just this whine in the camera that the, the person who doesn't work there every day, they're going to notice it and they're not going to focus on your message. You're on a mission and you just need more people to know about it. And whether you're brand new to marketing or a seasoned pro, we are all looking for answers to make marketing decisions with purpose. I'm Monica Pitts, a techie, crafty business owner, mom, and aerial dancer who solves communication challenges through technology. This podcast is all about digging in and going digital. I'll share my marketing know-how and business experience from almost 20 years of misadventures. I'll be your backup dancer so you can stop doubting and get moving towards marketing with purpose. Now, before we get started, I want you to mark your calendars for October 19th. It's a super exciting day. We have two really big things happening on October 19th. The first thing is we kick off our Craft Your Ask three-day challenge. So dedicate 15 to 20 minutes a day and join us as we write our year-end fundraising asks together with instructions and feedback and support all on the nonprofit Marketing with Purpose Facebook group. It's free, it's awesome, and the collaboration will really help you make sure you have the right year-end ask for your organization. And then the second thing that happens on October 19th is that registration opens for our year-end giving training. Now, this is the same training that helped our local nonprofits raise over $1.6 million last year. Well, that and like a metric ton of elbow grease and awesomeness because they are incredibly awesome and they worked really hard to earn all those donations. And I got to tell you, the thank you notes from this training are really what keeps me powering through the whole year because I know that I'm making a difference for these nonprofits. Now, this year, our training is going to consist of five on-demand year-end giving training modules. We will also have social media and email marketing schedules and templates for you to use and modify for your own campaign. And then we'll have live support in our breakout sessions and virtual office hours. And you can get all the details for that training at youmaycreate.com. That's Y-O-U-M-A-Y-E-C-R-E-A-T-E dot com. Registration closes November 15th. All right, now let's get to business. This is gonna be an awesome interview. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Marketing with Purpose. Today, I have with me Bruce Bishop, and I'm really excited because he's going to tell us all about setting the stage for good video. And I'm like looking at the lighting that that he has constructed for his video versus mine, and I'm like, dang, I am like a suckage right now. Like I did not rise it like you are so much better than me. Can I come on here and talk about lighting and video and not provide a good example? <laughs> well, and I know that Bruce is really, really good um, because he's helped us record everything from like drone footage to children's songs for the public library. And we've also done like instructional training videos together. And um it's really fun to work with you, Bruce, because you're like smart and you're creative and then you're the tech savvy and like you have all kinds of like fun equipment that you break out for these different things. And I'm like, what? Like, really what is that? I didn't even know that thing existed. <laughs> it's super cool. You're always um, looking through my Mary Poppins bag. Yes, your Mary Poppins bag. And so I get to do things like, you know, um, steam the backgrounds and tape things to the floor and um, oh he lets me use the clicker you know the set start and end and and Bruce lets me write on it yeah mm -hmm. change the theme yeah yeah <laughs> using his very own dry erase markers so I'm like, like extremely very important member of the crew you know but like really what happens when we go in is like I, you know, we set an appointment and Bruce will like survey the area and figure out what's going on. And then like, I mean, we spend as much time setting up a scene almost sometimes as we do filming a scene, depending upon what in the world's going on and how long the scene's yeah. going to be. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, so before we get too far down the rabbit hole of Monica's stories about like Bruce's awesomeness, Bruce, why don't you tell us why you're awesome? Tell us who you are. 
Well, I don't know about all that. But. <laughs> My name is Bruce Bishop. I'm the owner of Big Muddy Motion, and uh, I work here out of Columbia, but travel all over doing video uh, from drone and real estate footage to uh, business promotion, um, Amazon, Walmart videos for commercials for products that are being sold. Um, even have been down in the in the wedding game at one point in my career. So I started Big Money Motion in 2011 and um, didn't go to any sort of film school. So I learned trial by fire and uh, a lot of YouTube and just a lot of experience uh, with clients and a lot of great clients, including May Create. And, uh, and here we are to talk about video and what I've learned the hard way and hopefully help you from being able to make some of the same mistakes I had to go through. <laughs> um, so but I don't want to freak you guys out because like Bruce has some really awesome equipment and a lot of experience. But um, the reason I brought him on today is because I know that a lot of you guys are trying to construct your own videos and record your own videos and you need some tips about how to make them better. So the things he's going to share with us, yes, some of them might hinge upon his amazing abilities and um, Mary Poppins bag. But <laughs> some of it's also just like good common sense that maybe we hadn't thought about. Yeah. Or, um, so when I started thinking about like where we should start talking, I realized that probably like picking the right spot is probably a really like one of the biggest deals, right? Because it can impact everything from sound to lighting. I mean, all of it, right? And Absolutely. that's why we go look at a spot before you ever set up equipment in it. So tell me about that like how do you know a good spot from a bad spot what are you looking for yeah so you know video is really all comes down to lighting and sound i mean it's whether you have lights or not you know you, you're capturing shadows and shades of, of lightness so lighting is critical for the visual experience of the consumer and sound is obviously critical for the audible experience so um you know just looking at where light comes in you know if, if we're filming in, in an indoor scene I think one thing that gets underestimated quite a bit is how much space we actually need. You know, you can obviously film, you know, wherever you need to and however you need to in, in a pretty small amount of space, you know, but if you want to produce a higher quality final product, um, there's a few things that will really help and, and more space is, is certainly better. Um, so the first thing I'm going to look at if I show up on, on a location scout is do we have enough room to be able to separate our subject from the background and have room to separate the camera? Because I've been put in situations where somebody wants to be filming in their office and I walk into a cubicle side size office and, and sure, I can put the right lens on the camera and point it at your face, but it's going to be, it's going to look awful. And so, you know, one thing I think that gets missed a lot is separation from the subject from the background. So here's a prime example where I'm sitting today. You move that subject. I'm about eight feet from this wall behind me. If you move your subject from the background, you'll be able to, um, you know, get a little bit better depth behind me or a little more blurred out there. They um, aren't quite such a focus, but they're, they're there. Um, the next is really how far the camera is then going to be from the subject. So, you know, I've got another eight foot foot or so in front of me to get to the camera. So your subject from the background is a big one. And then where's the lighting coming from? You know, a lot of people, if you're filming your own, you probably don't have five or six big fancy lights to be able to light your subject up. So you got to use either the lighting that you've been given or hopefully maybe you've got a light or two. Um, so window light can be something we can certainly use. You know, where is the light coming in the window? Hopefully there's not sunlight coming directly in the window, but, you know, window light that's got light coming in can be a nice soft light. Um, so those are a couple of things I look for. Do I have enough room to set everything up and where is my light coming from? In some situations, you're better off to get rid of all the light that's there. If you have the luxury of having your own lights, I would just as soon get rid of all of the natural light in some cases and just light it exactly how I want with artificial light. Um, the next thing is sound. So, you know, sound is something that gets greatly overlooked. And I think people underestimate how powerful the microphones that we use are, and even the microphones on your on your phone, you know, that that is something that the consumer is going to pick up on pretty quick. If there's a distracting sound and they're going to lose um, attention to. And we've gone as far as unplugging refrigerators, unplugging ice machines, turning off air conditioners, all these little things that maybe you live or work in this space that you just are numb to because you always hear it. But as soon as you fire that camera up, it's just this whine in the camera that the, the person who doesn't work there every day, they're going to notice it and they're not going to, be able to focus on your message. So, you know, when I film in my studio, air conditioner gets turned off, or do you share a wall with another office? You know, is there 
you know, we've had children's pl- a preschool going on in the next door. You have a train go by, a bus go by, not to mention, you know, echoey type rooms. I'm sure this isn't the greatest footage in here, but um, anytime you're going to have a big space, you're going to have a lot of echo and you need a, a special microphone to be able to get get that taken care of. So those are all, you know, in a nutshell, you know, all things that I'm going to look for when I show up. I know that when we planned our office, we went from like room to room because we put like a studio set up in the office. And now I'm like, okay, and I have to move everything away from my wall. But like, it is a cubicle. I'm living in a cubicle right now. Um, But um, like there were certain rooms, there was one room that shares a wall with the bathroom. And I'm like, I don't know if I can put enough like sound blocking insulation to not hear every flush. That would yeah. really stink. I'm going to be like in a group doing an interview, flush. Out of order. <laughs> <laughs> Not awkward, right? And then there's another uh, room that shares like all the furnaces are in closets. So there's two furnaces for our tiny office. It's like 1,200 square feet. Two furnaces. Oh, yeah. no. I really don't. But it is loud in there. Like when those things power up, you're like in a white noise m- machine, basically, and you you can't even speak to the people in the office. They have to like, you have to either walk in or they have to walk out. It like blocks all the other stuff. So yeah. there are all kinds of weird things that people don't think about yeah. um, well, and that's, along those lines. Yeah, and, and if you're gonna be filming it yourself with a, a consumer type camera or, or an iPhone, you've gotta be more conscious of that. You know, I can get around some of those things with professional equipment, um, whether it's lighting and I've, you know, I've got dozens of lights or it's, you know, I move, the camera or the, the microphone to a lapel mic, or I, I, I change the type of microphone we use, I can get around some of those things. But if you're using the audio or the, the microphone on you on your camera or um, don't have any lights, you know, you can make great footage still with that equipment. You don't need the latest and greatest, but you just got to be that much more conscious. You know, there was, I think it was three or four years ago, there was a feature film. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but um, I wrote it down here. Unsane, it was called. The entire film was filmed with an iPhone i7s, and uh, it grossed fourteen million dollars. Wow! Filmed with an iPhone and played in the movie theaters. So it can be done. You just are more at the mercy of what your what your environment is. Yeah, we did. We've done like um, we did a few videos for Como Gives, just really organic videos. So Como Gives is our communities year-end giving campaign. We help 140, it'll be 149 this year, local nonprofits run their year-end giving campaigns on this website with the Community Foundation of Central Missouri. And so we went around and we interviewed all these group people on the streets of Columbia, just using an iPhone. But um, we did have them wear lapel mics and we did learn the hard way that if you do not have all the right connectors, you cannot just buy a lapel mic off of Amazon and connect it to a phone because it will not actually intake any audio. (laughs) And then the phone won't intake any audio either. And you will be stuck with people going. (laughs) And that really stinks because everything is just pretty much exploded at that moment. (laughs) Big frowny faces. (laughs) (laughs) It's happened. It happened. You end up with a Franken camera real fast. Uh So you already answered this question, but like, Maybe you could elaborate on it a little bit for us. Like how close or far away should your subject probably be from your camera? You said that you're sitting eight feet away probably from your camera and then you're sitting eight feet away also from the stuff behind you. Is that right? right? Yeah, um, about, the camera's probably a little closer than that. But yeah, okay. I'm about eight foot from the background. So a lot of it depends on what your what your message is or what you're going for, what is the ultimate outcome of the video? What do you want to portray? You know, if you, um, you know, um, you know, you can change some settings in the camera to get different backgrounds. But I think, you know, when you separate your subject from the background, you draw more attention to you. Hopefully the quality is good enough that I look clearer than the background looks. So the viewer can see behind me that there's stuff going on, that there's some cameras back there. There's some lights back there can't quite tell what they are, I should be in crystal clear focus. So your eyes appeal that there's stuff going on back here. It fits the narrative of what we're talking about, but you have no choice but to focus on me because I'm in focus, pun intended. (laughs) (laughs) So that helps create a appealing environment to the eye, but keeps the focus on the subject. 
then you know you can change the distance of the camera with different lenses. Um, you know, if you're going to be shooting with an iPhone, you're probably going to be closer. You do not want to get in a situation where you're zooming in with the camera because every time you zoom in with the camera because your distance is further, your quality goes awfully, awfully down. So you know, get the right distance without zooming in with your with your iPhone if you're going to be doing that. Um, and that might be four or five feet. Um, the other thing depends on how do you want to frame up your subject. So in this case, and in a lot of interviews, you know, you might be framing from the sternum to the top of the head and you don't want to cut the top of the head off and you don't want to show just wasted mid body. So you generally are going to frame in, you know, this far. So that may determine how far you are from your subject. If you're outdoors and you're filming a construction site or a, um, you know, an engineer or somebody that's working on a site, you know, he's standing at the job site. So in that case, you're probably going to be further from the subject because your, your distance is going to require it to get your entire, um, your entire talent in the scene. So that really is going to kind of dictate if you're going to do a podcast like this, four or five feet in front, you know, another six or eight feet behind and, and you'd be in pretty good shape. Then, um, so you just gave two examples, kind of like you're sitting, right? And then you gave the example on the job site of people standing. And I know that you definitely recorded both types of video for us. Is there a preference? Is there one that's maybe easier to work with sitting or standing for people who might be like not as um, experienced as you working with their equipment? But then also I feel like there's a big difference with, between people that we've recorded that some of them are super comfortable on camera and then some of them are like massively uncomfortable on camera. Like, is there some like, yeah, for yeah. sure. So yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, the first thing to take into consideration is what fits your narrative. You know, does it make sense for somebody to be standing or sitting? And that's the first thing I'm going to look at. If it, if it makes sense that this person's going to be sitting, then they're going to sit. If it makes first sense they're going to stand, they're going to stand. I would generally pick sitting in most cases because nine times out of 10, you're going to be filming somebody that's not comfortable in front of a camera. They're going to have awkward ticks. They're going to have awkward movements they can't see what you see behind the camera. So they don't know if they're moving off scene, if they're moving and people tend to wander if they're standing. So they might tap their foot, they might sway side to side. Um, there's a lot of things that happen to a standing person that's not comfortable in front of a camera that unless the scene were to just require it, I'm gonna pick sitting most of the time because that keeps that person static. It keeps them where I want them to be. And I don't have to worry about the lower half of their body ticks or, or anything like that that might be going on with a toe tap or, or something like that. So yeah, I would say sitting um, is, is probably the, the key. Yeah, my whole job half the time when we work together is just to make people not feel like they need to freak out. <laughs> <laughs> we have like a box of goodies, I guess that could be a tip. We have a box of goodies that are snacks that we, we have and um, like a comb and a mirror and um, dry shampoo and hairspray. And I'm always surprised at how much people use it. And um, well, it's powder, like yeah. face powder, you know, um, ladies come in and they're just like, they need to have these moments to make themselves feel good. Yeah. About Sometimes it's, camera. it's some people's first time in the spotlight. And so to get to actually feel like you're, you know, important and in the spotlight, which you absolutely are, you know, it's kind of cool to get the full experience and, and anything you can do to make people comfortable is better. I mean, we've obviously had experiences together where people were not comfortable and it's, it's not fun for anybody in the room. And really so um, it, it can be difficult you know, we're not hiring actors here and we've, we've been fortunate enough to work with actual actors too. And they're, it's just so awesome. But you know, when we're dealing with businesses and, and people that want to tell their story, then, you know, you're going to deal with somebody that this may be the very first time they've had a, a real camera shoved in their face and um, anything you can do to make it more comfortable is because it is a very uncomfortable situation. Bright lights, cameras, people talking, and then there's a high expectation from you to mm -hmm. get it right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all, all that together. It's yeah. great. Awesome. And you as the facilitator can do a good job of like, clearly communicating with people what they're going to do, if they're going to have a script, if they need to read the script, where you're going to put it, give it to them ahead of time, if they need to memorize it. Like, those are all things that you can communicate ahead of time and make sure that they're comfortable in the situation. I don't even know if you can, like, over communicate those types um, of things. Like, it, it's better. <laughs> yeah, um, so 
Then lighting, I feel like lighting, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but that's like one of the things I feel like people fail at really well. Um, like if you watched the political, um, like around the campaign last year, we had all these people that were um, recording out of their homes, like coming into the newsroom virtually. Yeah. And I was looking at them and I'm like, what are they thinking? Like, who did this? Like, did they not know? Anyway, like anything from the backdrop, like one lady looked like she had like things growing out of her head <laughs> because she had this huge arrangement of flowers behind her. And I'm like, you look like you're wearing a fern hat. Like, <laughs> she didn't know. Yeah. Um, what can we do to make sure, I mean, you have the awesome lights, windows, any other suggestions? Yeah, so, um... There's a lot of, I mean, lighting is everything when it comes, to, I mean, it, it, you're going to spend, I mean, when I look at a site after, and I can figure the sound out in, in two minutes. I mean, you, you dealt with what you're dealt with. Can we turn it off? Can we not? We'll deal with the rest from there. Lighting, lighting changes everything because you can change the lighting to, um, to change the mood of what you want to talk about. You know, if you want, um, I'm trying to think of an example that we might use, but if you wanted more of a dark, ominous type feel, you know, maybe part of your scene is telling a story from the past or something like that, and you want it to feel kind of scary and dark, then, you know, you're going to want more shadows, and one side of the face is going to be darker, and the other side is going to be lighter, um, you know, and then there may be cases where you want everything to be light and airy, and you want everything to be lit, you know, pretty evenly, and so it really just depends on what uh, message you're, you want to portray, but generally speaking, you know, you can't go wrong with pretty even lighting. You know, you don't want a bunch of shadows on one side of the face that look you're going for. Um, the bigger thing is really trying to light your subject and your background separately. Otherwise, they your, your scene starts to look pretty flat. And so like you can see what I've done here is I've got a light shining right on me. So I stand out from the background. The background can be kind of dark. And so that's a, a good way to kind of, again, draws the attention of the viewer towards, towards the subject. So if you can separate and light them individually, um, that makes a big difference. Um, glare is a big thing to watch out for, and it's very tough to manage, um, especially if you're outside. You know, dealing with outside, you're gonna have all the light in the world that you possibly need, but you're gonna have too much light in some cases. And so um, inside, generally you're gonna, too dark is gonna be your bigger problem if you don't have artificial lighting and outside too bright is gonna be your problem. So, um, you know, glare, whether it's glasses or, um, or a bald person like myself, you're gonna get, you can get glare off the top of the head, all those things, you gotta figure out ways to soften the light to be able to fix that, whether it's glasses, skin, whatever. So they make diffusers, which are more or less thin bed sheets that you can use to block some of the light to try to keep it from being so harsh. You know, if, if you think about filming outside, you know, a lot of times if I can diffuse the person to where it doesn't look like they're standing in the shadow of a tree, that helps. But if you don't have that equipment, um, using the shadow of a tree, the shadows go inside of somewhere, but know, you know, on a full bright day that, you know, if you're going to be in the shadow and you're going to be filming with outside of the shadow in the background, it's going to be really bright. And that's okay in a lot of cases, as long as your subject is properly exposed. And same thing, if you were to put that subject out in the sun and film them out in the sun, one, they're going to be squinting and possibly sweating and very glary. And anything, yeah, anything, bald, anything that's in the shadows is going to be like black, black. So hmm. you know, anytime you can diffuse some of that light, you'll help. That'll help. If you're outside, and I've said this before, if you're at the mercy of whatever light nature is going to give you filming in the first hour to hour and a half of daylight and the last hour and hour and a half of, of the evening will provide you with the best light to, to provide an appealing experience without really needing a lot of auxiliary lighting. So that's, if you're stuck outside, then you utilize that time frame as best you can. You do not want to be out there filming at noon because it's pretty unflattering. It's like the gloaming hours. Like I, there's these times a day where I can take my kids outside and I see them from like the vantage point of an artist. And I'm like, wow, you people are glowing right now. And that's the time of day that you want to like take them out to take pictures. Unfortunately, the days are pretty long now. And so you can get that in. I think it's not as easy in well, maybe that's the problem is you got to get up at four o'clock right now to beat that time frame where you don't get done until 11 o'clock because you're still taking stuff down. So sometimes it's easier in the wintertime just because you're still during work hours when it's getting dark. So yeah. Yeah. My running partner and I, we run at 5am and it is light. It is 
basically light by 5.30 now. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's getting brighter early. It, it'll like wane off though. Like yeah, give it well, another month and. Yeah. Well, I know when I go to film some, I do the same thing with the drone footage. I try to film first, first light because I can't artificially light that. So I'm dealt with the sun. And so I film the first hour to two hours in the morning and the same in the evening. And if I'm going to do house sometimes to get to some of these properties at two to three o'clock in the morning so I can be at the property at sunrise and those are long days <laughs> yeah that's how I feel Coffee. about that <laughs> like, the only time I want to get up at two or three o'clock in the morning is if I'm getting on a plane to Mexico <laughs> then I'm happy about it. I'm not happy but I'll do it and outside of that I'm like no no it has to at least say four the first number on the clock has to be a four in order for me to like leave the bed <laughs> no doubt <laughs> I'm spoiled. Yeah. Um, so then wardrobing. I do see a lot of people in like tight stripes and weird things going on and they like literally vibrate. Yeah. So do you have any suggestions on what we could coach people to wear in the videos? Yeah. So the first thing you, you hit it right on the head is tight patterns are generally awful. Just the way cameras catch capture the light. The other thing you know, without getting too complicated, different types of lights work different ways. And whether your eyes can perceive it or not, like light, lights pulsate. And so um, if you have that busy pattern, you're going to get exactly like you said, almost looks like the shirt's moving on its own. So mm -hmm. stay away from tight stripes, polka dots, tight, tight patterns. Um, generally speaking, I'll tell most people solid colors, please, is, is the best case scenario or big patterns. Um, the other thing is thinking about your background. So if you've got an outside background and you've got somebody in a floral shirt, they're going to blend right in like they're wearing camouflage. <laughs> so you don't want floral patterns generally. Um, you know, white video is getting more and more popular with just a white background. You don't generally want a white shirt with a white background. Otherwise you can look like a floating head. Same thing for a black shirt and a black background. We do a lot of white and black backgrounds. You're going to blend in. Um, I, I doubt very many of your viewers are probably doing this, but we, I do a fair amount of it. If you're doing green screen or blue screen work, if you wear green or you wear blue, you literally will be a floating head by the time the scene's over. It's, it's not possible. So uh, <laughs> hopefully, you know, if, if we're doing it professionally, we're going to communicate that with you ahead of time. Hey, we storyboarded that we're going to use a white background. Please, please choose a solid color. Please don't wear white. Um, and, and we can go from there. If you're doing it on your own, you know, just stick to those things. Don't, you don't want your subject wearing the same color shirt that their background is going to be in most cases and stay away from the tight patterns. You might. So one of the things that I found really, really challenging last year is I was at home from COVID and I was using like the crappiest camera on earth. So like those little webcams, right? So if you're going to try to record with like one of those little Logitech webcams, they do not like high contrast. Like if I put a black background behind me and wear a white shirt, it cannot figure it out. It's like nothing is going to be lit right. Or if I have a white background and a black shirt, it is a hot mess. I don't understand it, but I just like, if you have a really crappy camera, test the colors. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that because in a nicer camera, it, it hasn't been a problem, but I could never get that thing to focus right. Yeah. It was just a POS pretty much. Yeah, when you're trying to use auto functions. And that's one of the first things they tell you when you start learning how to use cameras to, to get it out of automatic. And yeah. so that's some of those cameras, you don't have a choice. You know, it's gonna, it's trying to make your life easy. And then in the end, it's making your life hard. And so automatic is tough. I mean, it's great for somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, but it can certainly present a lot of challenges, so. The only time that it would focus right is if I put my hands up next to my head like antlers and then everything would be fine and it would all be the right color. <laughs> then I would you put it the down whole thing that way. And I would like disappear. And I'm like, what yes. is heaven? It, yeah. Ugh, so I weird. recommend bringing multiple outfits a lot of times. So that way, in case something just doesn't work like that, you know, it's nice to have a couple changes and maybe we want to do more than one scene and maybe make it look like we shot something on more than one day and we just have you change shirts and flip your hair over to the other side and, and roll on. And so uh, it never hurts to, to bring a, a change of clothes as an option. So for those people who can flip their hair over to the other yeah, side. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wouldn't know anything about it. <laughs> I have a big nice. cowlick on um, the right side of my head. So it literally doesn't flip to the other side. It only parts on one side. <laughs> it works for you. So is there anything that you would tell people like, do not do this? This is not a good idea. Like maybe common mistakes that you see all the time. 
Um, you know, there's a few things that I think, you know, you get, you see get abused. One of those, you know, a couple of the key things, if you're going to film your own of, of being able to put your camera in a, in a manual mode, um, even if it's not completely manual, that's a big thing because, um, you know, one thing I'll see happen too is with autofocus. So if you've got autofocus on your camera and your subjects moving and you're trying to film in one cut, you know, and, and the autofocus, you know, on, on newer cameras, the autofocus is incredible. It literally tracks your eye and keeps that in focus. But older cameras or, or consumer type cameras, if you're trying to film that and the subjects come moving forward or back, whatever the case might be, you're going to have parts of your clip in focus and out of focus. And it's going to be, it's going to be, become unusable. So that's a big one. You know, you use manual focus if you have that, that option. Um, you know, sound is another one. You know, we talked quite a bit about that. Take a step back uh, to the things that you become ear blind to and think about what else is, is in the scene that's going to provide those types of um, distracting sounds. But, you know, like I said, people are making multi-million dollar feature films with, with iPhones, so it can be done. Um, it's just paying a little more attention. And the lower quality camera you have, the, the more attention you've got to pay. So, um, you know, outside of that, I, I mean, it, it's really just an eye thing. It's, it's capturing what you want out of the final shot, you know, and I encourage people, I've gotten a lot better at this over the years of making a shot list. What do you want this to be? Don't, don't just put somebody in front of a camera and say, Hey, just, just tell us something about something, you know, because they're going to clam up or they're not going to get you the right message. And, um, and you don't want worse content out there than, than doing nothing. So, you know, have a plan, have a message that you want to get across and, and do it. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're not doing video now, one of the bigger things I think I could tell you is stop not doing video because 82% <laughs> of all internet traffic consumed is video right now. And if you're not telling your story for yourself, somebody else is probably out there telling your story about you for you. And they're creating your story without your input. And so with that much video and the way people utilize their phones and the, and the Google ads and the, um, or the Google reviews, I mean, and um, you know, all those types of things that can happen. If you're not trying to tell your story for yourself and tell people what you, what, why you do what you do, then somebody else is potentially out there doing that for you. And it's probably not the message that you want. So, you know, I, I, I did a little research looking some stuff up, but they say that, um, uh, 34% of job applicants are more likely to follow through with an application if there's video involved in who they're going to work for. So, um, you know, I think a lot of that goes to the newer generation, the newer generation. Now they want to know the story of who they're doing business with or who they're doing business for, who they're working for. They don't, they want to know where their food comes from. They want to know the story of the people they work for, the products that they buy. And, you know, they're moving more away from the big box stores and they want to do more local, but they want to know who you are to do that. And whether that, that may means that they want to come work for you or they want to buy your product, they want to connect with you. And video does that time and time over better than, than pictures or text. I know that um, in our donor survey for our Como Gives donors, so out of 950 respondents, the number one reason why they give in that campaign is because they give locally, because they know that the money is going to be consumed on a local level and they're like helping their own community. And so having your own video footage and telling your own story about what their money goes to is going to be a huge part of your success in proving to them that you're doing the thing that needs to be done. Like you're filling in the gaps for our community and making things work. And the video is just one more way that you can show them. I mean, you can give them an annual report and that's great. And you can also show them happy, smiley, thankful people. And, um, and that's even, I, I almost think even better. I, I love data, obviously, yeah. but like, the happy, smiling people is pretty awesome. Well, I think too, I mean, I think people more and more trust just pictures and text less because it can be fabricated. I mean, we all understand Photoshopped images and how easy it is to, or even stock footage. I mean, you talk about the smiling, happy people. I can go online and in 30 seconds, I can have you an image on my webpage that shows smiling, happy people. I don't know who any of those people are, but they're smiling and happy, but video is harder to manipulate and it seems more genuine. You know, they, they, 
you can connect much easier with a video and hearing somebody talk and you can connect with that they seem genuine with a picture. I mean, yeah, pictures can be beautiful and they can tell a great story about your business and they, and they absolutely need to be part of your marketing plan. But, you know, video is what people connect with. I think two other suggestions that I would give to people is use a tripod um, because like your hands and body are just not stable items, quite frankly. And Absolutely. you don't want people to feel like they're getting seasick, especially if you're like videoing people in like a setting and it's an interview and you're not doing some weird panning motion or anything like that. I feel like a tripod can be a huge asset. And then one thing that I feel like you do really well for us is you always have your filming from multiple directions just in case something goes wrong <laughs> and one you have the other <laughs> and you can flip your you know your different roles and it, and it's okay yeah. cuz i'm actually surprised when i watch people's like testimonial videos or um interviews how infrequently they actually show the people looking at the camera it's it's more frequently that they're showing this side angle that you know is this ambiance kind of building thing it and and then they'll like switch over to the person when they're saying something very impactful like looking at the camera and yeah so i guess the third thing i would say is just pay attention to what you like especially if you're working with a videographer like bruce because then you can like direct and hey like hey i like this i like this look i like this feel, but you don't realize how people are putting together the video footage until you start paying attention to it. Cause you're just consuming it on a very like natural, almost subconscious level. And that, cause we're just so used to it. We just consume it subconsciously. And then when you start like watching it consciously, you're like, Oh, look, I see the same pattern in all these different commercials. There must be something to it. It's like a pop song. Yeah every pop song has the exact same like, recipe, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I'm not saying you can do that with videos, but just paying attention sure. to what you like. And Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it takes all those elements. I mean, and I think, you know, if, if you're watching a video for the first time, if you're noticing things, if, if I think the best way to put this, if you're noticing things about the video that to tell you this was a video, like that there's a videographer behind here, then it's, it's been done poorly. That that means that you notice that the camera shakes or you notice something in the background that's making noise or you notice the glare on the head and all of those things cause you to be distracted from the message. And so if any of that is happening, your viewer is is losing the connection with, with your message. And so, um, you know, like you said, anything you can do to basically put the viewer in, in the scene, make them feel like they're having a conversation with it, that they don't feel like they're watching a video because any of those things that change or glitch that causes the, the viewer to all of a sudden have a reaction of well, wait, what happened? And then you scroll on or you're done. You don't want the, your consumer to realize that you are watching a film. You want them to get in, invested in it and, and, and connect and all those things that take away from it, make it hard. So any final advice that you want to give these lovely individuals listening to us today about setting the stage for their videos? Yeah. So you know, I would, I would say come up with a plan, you know, that's, that's the best thing is, you know, don't just call Monica or call me and say, Hey, um, I want to do a video. I have no idea. I mean, that's a great place to start, but most people get inspired by something. So sit down and think about what your story is. What do you want your clients or your potential employees or your customers to know about you and your business and what you do and what products or services you provide? And then, and then brainstorm what the best way to do with that, that is. Um, don't, I think I said it before, don't just point a camera at somebody and say, hey, tell them where you came from and what you do. I mean, that can certainly be a part of the message, but you know, the, the higher the quality, the more easy it is the viewers to connect with, with you and your purpose. And so think about what that purpose is and then build a shot list, build a plan, do a location scout. You know, that's, that's one of the worst things I think pe people make mistakes people make is they just say, Hey, let's just meet here and film that day and never go there. And then you show up and you're like, Oh my God, I don't know how to deal with any of this stuff. I, unless it's just, unfathomably far, I don't always do a location scout because I don't want surprises on the day of the film. 
it can be surprises in ways that you didn't even think of too. Like I've gotten to locations and been like, there's no outlets. Yeah. Like in this whole room, like it's beautiful. The lighting is wonderful, but it's a really old home. And there is not an outlet for like a hundred feet, right? Or something crazy like that. And so then you're like, oh my gosh, I don't even have an extension cord or any type of like thing that's gonna manage this. And if you had scouted it out beforehand, then yeah. you would have known and hopefully you're not gonna blow the fuse. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna be surprised. I can tell you, I don't know if there's ever been a shoot that I've gone to that I didn't have an unfortunate surprise, but I've limited those significantly by going to the site ahead of time. I mean, there's been numerous times I've had clients say, yep, I got the perfect spot, got everything you need, got the outlets. I mean, I got a, a number of questions I ask now because I know, and then I, you know, I still ask, hey, do you mind if I swing by for 10 minutes and just see the space and you get there and it's like, a eight by eight space that they provide and it's a beautiful space but uh -huh. it's no physical way to film in it and so you know those types of things that, that they're invaluable to going out and and looking um the other thing is the talent that's probably one of the biggest challenges that i faced um and there it, there's not always an easy way around it you know you can have somebody that's just gung-ho and they're ready and they agree and they're going to read the script and they're going to memorize it and they've got it memorized and they show up and they look beautiful and everything is perfect and you flip those lights on and hit record and it turns into a clam and the i mean it is it happens a lot more probably more often than it doesn't happen and so there's a lot of ways around that um sometimes you know monica you mentioned the scene where you see the side of the face more than you see the front sometimes mm -hmm. that's just because that person needs to read and they can't they've forgotten their lines or whatever they're going to say and you don't want the camera necessarily in front of them because they're looking just off to the side like this and you can tell they're not talking to the camera. So now you've got, you know, that looks awful. So it's a lot better to just film the side and take your money shots that you can get right in the front of the lens. Mm -hmm. So consider a teleprompter. It's something that I've invested in that, you know, it's just, there's just some people that this is going to be the easiest way to do it. You know, red scripts never sound as good as genuine scripts, but sometimes that's the only way you get through it. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing I would say too, when it comes to scripts is sometimes it's not always best to give your talent the script ahead of time because you want the most genuine off the cuff response you can possibly get. And if you've given the person the questions or telling them what to say, then um, it doesn't come off as genuine sometimes. Just like if you're reading it from a teleprompter, you don't write like you read. So things just sound a little bit different. Um, and, and as the videographer or the producer, I would say to, you know, go into it knowing what responses you want from your talent, mm -hmm. because, you know, you're going to have a lot of cuts and a lot of takes. And if you know, all right, this is the goal. I need this person to say this. It could be that um, the reason why we do this is because we like making a difference. And that's what keeps our company going. That's the line you want from your, from your talent. Well, if you get the, if you tell them that's what you want them to say, it doesn't always sound very good. So think about asking a, a long list of probing questions. Like what questions can I ask to get that person to say exactly that thing? And mm -hmm. if you, I think that's where you change the level of, I just showed up the film today to I'm actually a producer is when you can ask the questions that gets your talent to say the things that you want them to say. And then it's more like a conversation between you and the person you'll cut it together to make a nice clip after it's over. But mm -hmm. if you can ask the questions that get them to say the answers that you're looking for and nice, crisp, genuine answers, that's gold. We literally will um, construct like our perfect testimonial. I will say, this is what I want this testimonial to say. And then I'll write questions that I think will get that answer. I go to another person on my staff and I ask them the question and they don't give me that answer. And I'm like, okay, that was not the right question. Like, I don't know. And so then I try another question, right? I'm like, well, what if I asked it like this? What if I asked it like this? Until eventually you have questions that will actually yield the answers that you're looking for, but it's always a process to get there. And I start at the end, like, this is what I need from this situation. Now, what's my first gut reaction? It's wrong. That's cool though. I got to get through that one so I can get to the right one. And you just got to keep processing. And it's kind of fun. Yeah, actually, um, to, to go through it, but it, it takes some well, and, that, and that comes back to having your end vision in mind. Know what you know, the message that you want to portray. Start exactly like you said, start at the end. This is what I want my customers to know about me or my employees to know about me or to know that I provide a, in a work environment. And 
this is how I want to portray that in video, then we can work together to come up with, all right, let's come up with a couple of scenes and a couple of shots that, you know, portray that. And then if I know that's what you want in the end to, to get across, I can come up with the questions to lead you to the answers. And if we're on the same page, you know, we'll, we'll get there together, but having that plan and not just winging it, that's, that's a disaster waiting to happen. And you start to put out bad content and we all know once it gets on the internet, it doesn't go away from the internet. <laughs> so you gotta be careful with what goes out there. Yes. But I mean, friends, for sure, like, you start where you are. Everybody does. And so I think that Bruce has given us a lot of really good information today about setting our scene and planning for our video shoots. And I hate calling them shoots, you know, um, filming sessions. There you go. We're not shooting people. We're videoing and filming them, right? <laughs> like, so. It's the same thing with photo shoots. It just seems so primal. Yeah. It's not right. Um, everything from lighting to positioning, got all that stuff. So thank you so much. Let everybody know, like, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, so there's several different ways. Um, I'm on social media, so Facebook, Instagram, uh, Big Muddy Motion. Um, find me in either one of those places, direct message me. Like and follow always helps, um, YouTube. And then I've also got a webpage, uh, www.bigmuddymotion.com. So uh, you can see some of my work there and, um, and also send me an email or a message at uh, bigmuddymotion at gmail.com. Thank you so much. No problem. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. And before I let you go, I wanna remind you one last time to mark your calendar for October 19th. Join me and other nonprofits in crafting your year-end fundraising ask on the Nonprofit Marketing with Purpose Facebook group. And also go over to youmaycreate.com, Y-O-U-M-A-Y-E-C-R-E-A-T-E.com and check out what we're offering this year for year-end giving training. I'll see you there. And until next time, go forth and market with purpose.